Probably more than anything, I want to thank SJP, not just for this event, but for many years of incredible activism. And I speak at a lot of events that are hosted by SJP, and I say this again and again, and it cannot be said enough. You guys, with the work that you do on campuses over the years, you have changed the way people talk about Palestine. You have changed the way people think about Palestine. You have changed the way the conversation about Palestine takes place. And for that, you should be extremely proud of yourselves. So let's hear a hand, yeah, absolutely, for SJP everywhere. Um, I don't think, I, I mean, I know that when you're in it, when you're a member of SJP, when you're a student in this college or any other college, it's sometimes hard to see and hard to appreciate the enormity of your contribution. But I will tell you this, when Palestine is free, you guys and the generations of SJP before you and after you will definitely be able to look in the mirror and be very proud of yourselves because you will have had an important hand, an important role in bringing justice and freedom to Palestine. So keep on doing what you're doing. You're doing tremendous work. You're making a huge change for the better. Um, and this is something that, again, you are going to be able to be proud of for the rest of your lives. Um, now, this is, I don't know how many times I've been here at, San, at, at UCSD to speak. Um, one of the first times I was here uh, as, a, as a guest of uh, Dr. Fields was to speak at his class several years ago, and then there was the um, very well organized, very well um, run divestment, um, uh, divestment vote here on campus. And again, it was run by SJP, and it, it, was, the one of the it was one of the most impressive um, events, one of the most impressive processes, procedures that I've ever seen. And it was run just by students just like you guys. So again, congratulations to you guys for all your tremendous, tremendous work. And then I've been here several times since um, to speak. Now, I want to ask you guys a question. Is there anybody here who is actually from Palestine or Israel, however you choose to call it? A few people? Okay, anybody here been there to visit? Okay, a few more people. Is there anybody here who couldn't find it on a map if they tried? Who couldn't find it on a map? Everybody can find it on a map, because you know it's a very small place. Even though we hear about it and we talk about it a lot, it's actually a very, very small place. Um, in fact, if you try to place the name of the country, whether you call it Palestine or Israel, and you look at a map, it's usually not on the country itself because it doesn't fit. It usually covers half of the Mediterranean, Cyprus or something. Um, but here we are, you know, talking about this issue, thinking about this issue, fighting over this issue. Um, and it, I think it is, it is definitely an issue that is defining everybody who is in the room, everybody who is alive at this time. And here in the United States, there's no such thing as, um, as being on the fence on this issue. One way or another, you're either on one side or the other. Because so much of our tax money, so much of our tax money goes to support Israel, that unless you stand up and oppose it, you are, you come down on one side. So it's incredibly important to be informed, it's incredibly important to know what you're paying for, and if you agree, fine, but if you disagree, you need to stand up. And I think that's, 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 a, that's, that's a key point that I think people often forget in this country. We pay an enormous amount of money to support Israel. And it's important that we all understand where the money is going, how it's being used. Now, like you heard, the story that I bring, the story that I have is um, perhaps a little strange because I come from probably what can be described as maybe the most patriotic, pro-Israeli background you could possibly imagine. I didn't learn about Israel and Zionism in a class or in a course. I learned about it growing up in it. Um, in my family, there was the, my father, who was a general, who, of course, is, of course, very, you know, people consider it to be very impressive. And when you're an Israeli, where the military is really everything, to have a father who's a general is something you, that is 
a big part of your life. But he wasn't the only one. I had other family members. We had a president of the state of Israel in our family, and ambassadors, and cabinet members, and so on. So the, the conversation was always about how we contribute to the state, and how somebody else contributed to the state, and what is going to be the future of the state, and how proud we were of the fact that we have established the state, and so on and so on. I was talking to another group of students on the East Coast a couple of weeks ago, and they asked me, they wanted to know what it was like growing up like that. And it, as I was talking, it dawned on me, it is borderline fascism. Because when the state is everything, then that's exactly, that's exactly the definition of fascism. And it was very, very much borderline fascism because the state was everything. Um, and here I am. You know, I'm out here speaking here tonight and everywhere else uh, around the country and around the world and I've, for years speaking about Palestinian rights and justice for Palestinians and from a perspective that is totally rejecting Zionism and totally rejecting the state of Israel. So that's quite a turnaround. And the title of my book is The General Son and that's pretty obvious. That's that patriotic upbringing. The subtitle of the book is Journey of an Israeli in Palestine. And that subtitle, I think, is the crucial, the crucial part of the story. Because what is an Israeli? And what is Palestine? Where is Palestine? Where is Israel and where is Palestine? How, do they, how, does, how, how does the country change from one thing to the other? Uh, we know that historically Palestine was called Palestine until on the 15th of May, 1948, it became Israel. So what happened? How could, it, how could something like this take place? Um, and this goes back to the need to understand, to the need to learn, to the need to really know what this issue is about and how this transformation took place, how this transition took place. And like I said, in my family, there was a whole, you know, a whole host of people who were involved in that process. So of course, I grew up learning and, and, and being told how heroic it was and how important it was, and how proud we should all be to be part of this family that has done so much. But again, here I am talking about Palestinian rights and rejecting all of that. Now, the journey of an Israeli, an Israeli in Palestine is really the journey of someone who grew up privileged, who grew up in the privileged sphere, who grew up in the sphere where there's, the electricity always works, where the water is always running, where the roads are paved, where if you want to water the lawn, you water the lawn, where it's safe, as safe as any, any, any place could be, into the sphere of the other, the sphere that we are told is inhabited by people who are somehow less than us because they are not as sophisticated, they're not as educated, they're not as capable, they're also dangerous, they also hate us and they also want to kill us which is why we never cross from one sphere to the other. And here I was going from this one sphere that was very comfortable, to, because to grow up in a privileged society, and I'm sure many of you here grew up in privileged societies too, or else you wouldn't be in this campus, we don't tend to go in to see the other sphere, because we were told our whole life that, it, that it's dangerous. We were told our whole life how they want to kill us. We were told our whole lives how they are irrational. And in Palestine, and you'll notice as I speak that I refer to Palestine when I talk about the country, I refer to it as Palestine, the entire country. In Palestine, which is a very small country, the two spheres are always very, very close geographically, sometimes literally across the street from, from each other. Now, I grew up in Jerusalem, and one of the things we hear when people describe Jerusalem is that it's a unified city a city that was unified, that was brought together. I grew up in Jerusalem. I never saw a Palestinian. I never met a Palestinian. I shouldn't say I never saw a Palestinian, but I never met a Palestinian. There are no, you know, growing up and going to school, there were no events that Israelis and Palestinians did together. We go to separate schools. We live in separate neighborhoods. We speak different languages. We even dress differently. And the segregation between the two communities, even in a city like Jerusalem, where they really are, they live in, in they really do, the, the, the neighborhoods are very close to each other, 
is incredible, is incredibly effective. And this is true throughout the entire country. The segregation between the two communities could not be more effective. And then I decided to take this, I embarked upon this journey. Now, geographically, like I said, this journey is not very impressive because the country is small. And very often, the, this journey from one sphere to the other means you just have to cross the street. But emotionally, politically, mentally, in every other way, it is an enormous, an enormous journey. And the fact is that the vast majority of people who grew, grew up privileged like I did as an Israeli Jew in Palestine do not take this journey. Do not dare to take this journey, even today. Even today, and I, was just, I just came back from Palestine, it was a week ago. When I get in my car and I drive to a Palestinian town, people around me say, are you sure? Are you sure it's safe? Are you going to be OK? Are you going to spend the night there? Do you have to spend the night there? Maybe you should come home. Because you know, you never know these people. That's the kind of discourse that I still hear today. Sadly, for us as people, for us as humans, to take an enormous step like that, to take a step that forces us to reevaluate everything we know, something terrible needs to happen. What drives us to go and take that dangerous step, what drives us to reflect and rethink everything we know is true, sadly, usually comes as a result of something terrible. In my case, my sister's little girl was killed in a suicide attack in 1997. She was 13 years old. And that's exactly the kind of horrific experience that drives you or drives a person to reflect. And that was the process that I went through. How could you possibly understand? How could we possibly wrap our heads around the fact that three young men decide to take their own lives in such a violent way and in the process kill a whole bunch of other innocent people, including children. How, do we, how are we supposed to understand that? I don't think we're capable of understanding that. But still, it deserves a moment of pause. It deserves that we stop for a minute and think about it. I don't think we're ever, I don't think as humans we're ever really capable of understanding it, but we should give it a try. We should stop and think. How is it that something like this can happen? When that took place, I was living here in the United States. And the journey that I took, my journey into Palestine, began here in San Diego. The first time I met Palestinians, and again, I'll remind you, I grew up in Jerusalem which is a, supposedly a mixed city. The first time I sat in a Palestinian home, the first time I sat and had a conversation with Palestinians was here in San Diego. And last night we had an event in Point Loma and a lot of those old friends were there. And even that, I'll never forget the day I drove up to Rancho Bernardo to the home of the first Palestinian I ever visited. Many of you know him, George Khoury. That was the first time I drove by myself to a Palestinian home. And I'll never forget the drive and then standing by the door and just before I knocked and, or, or rang the doorbell. It was an enormous step and there was always, and there was fear involved. Then the next big step was in Palestine itself, getting in a car and driving into a Palestinian town. And I describe it in the General Sun, the very first time I actually drove myself into, it was actually a, in, into the West Bank. There was no doubt in my mind that that was going to be my last day on earth. I didn't see the beautiful landscape, I didn't see the hills, I didn't see the beautiful olive trees. All I saw, or I should say all I imagined, 
was an Arab behind, around the curb or behind a tree that's waiting to kill me. And this is how Israelis still think today. When I drive, for example, to Ramallah, or to Hebron, or anywhere else, or even to Palestinian towns that are within what's called proper Israel, not, not the West Bank, People will say to me, like I said earlier, are you sure this is safe? Are you sure you're going to be okay? And when I say, well, come with me and you'll see, they go, oh, no, 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 no. They know you, so you're okay. But if we show up, that's going to be a whole different thing. This assumption, which I shared, that as soon as I cross some imaginary line, or as soon as I go past some checkpoint, everything is going to stop. Everybody's going to stand up and look at me and either want to kill me, or want to hurt me, or want to kidnap me, because they got nothing better to do. This is part of the privilege mentality. I'm so important that as soon as I cross the checkpoint going to Ramallah, everything will stop, and they're going to look at me and decide what to do with me. And I remember the first time I drove past the checkpoint. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nobody cared. The traffic didn't stop. People didn't close down their stores. Nobody had a gun. Nobody had a weapon. Nobody cared. It made absolutely no difference to anyone that I was there. And that was probably the biggest shock of all. Because we know as soon as we come in, they're going to want to kill us. The depth of that thinking is not, is again, it's one of those things that's, that now that I'm out of it and I look back at it, people who still possess it, it's hard, to, it's hard to understand. It's hard to believe. But this is, I think, a typical perspective of people who grow up in the privileged sphere. That the other, all the other wants to do is to kill us and harm us somehow, because that's how they are. Not because we deprived them or anything, not because we took away their land, not because we take away their water, not because we kill their children, not because we incarcerate them. No, 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 no. It's just because they're irrational and they hate us. And therefore, you never know. All it takes is one. And of course, we know that in Palestine, the violence does not come from the Palestinians. The violence is not initiated by the Palestinians. Quite the opposite. They're on the receiving end of the violence and have been for a very long time. So that's the narrative. That's the perspective. And the journey that I began here in San Diego some 20 years ago or so continues. The journey of discovery into Palestine is something which really never ends for two reasons. Number one, it's a fascinating country. And if you've not been there, you should go. If you've not visited Palestine, you should definitely go visit because it's a fascinating country. But beside, beyond that, the complexities of the reality in Palestine is something that we cannot grasp unless we're there. Let me give you an example. One of the things that we hear a lot, and I grew up learning this to be the truth, that, you know, when the Jews, the Zionists came to Palestine, they developed it, and they made the desert bloom, and they made it nice, and they brought sophistication, and so on and so forth. Therefore, when you drive along the highways, you look at the Israeli towns, at the Jewish colonies, and they're beautiful. They're modern. They're well lit. They've got great roads. They seem very safe. They're green. And you look at the Palestinian towns, and it's not like that. It's not like that. Things are falling apart, potholes, water shortages, all kinds of problems. And even to this day, when people visit the country, they make that statement. Look how, look how sophisticated and look how developed and look how much, the, how much good the Jews brought when they came to Palestine, the Zionists brought when they came to Palestine, and then look at these Arabs. But here's what people leave out. And if you go visit, or when you go visit, you should take a look. When you drive along the highways, very often you're going to see the Israeli colonies on one side and the Palestinian towns on the other. Look at the rooftops. 
On the Palestinian side, you're going to see these enormous black water tanks. On the Israeli colonies that, by the way, are built on the, Palest on the land of some of these, of, of, of these Palestinian towns, you don't see these water tanks. Never. In fact, as Israelis, we don't even know they exist. So you have to wonder, what is this all about? Israel controls all of the water in the country, all of it. Israel has a, a state uh, water agency called Mekorot. You may have heard of it. And Mekorot controls all the water and distributes the water. Palestinians are allocated 3% of the water. 3%. Now, between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean, which is historic Palestine, Palestinians make up the majority of the population. Out of some 12 million people, about 7 million are Palestinians. Yet they receive 3% of the water. So what that means is quite often that Palestinians will get 10 or 12 or 15 hours of running water per week. So you've got to have the tank in order to store the water. You will never see that in any Israeli town, in any Israeli settlement, in any of them, in any Israeli farm. There's no such thing as, not amp as living without ample water as much as you want and more. There's no such thing. You never have to think if you want to open the tap and drink the water or take a shower or water the lawn. You never have to think about that. Now, you take a look at a Palestinian town or a Palestinian village, and across the street you take a look at the Israeli colony, at the Israeli town. There's a vast difference in the way the town is going to look if they have ample water or if they have limited water. It's not that the Israelis are more sophisticated, more developed. It's that they have privilege. They're given more water. It has nothing to do with the laws. It has nothing to do with occupation or not occupation. This is true throughout all of Palestine. In fact, the term occupation is an interesting term. And those of us who are on the Palestine Solidarity Team, if you, if you will, I think we need to drop that term. Because the occupation talks about a very small part of Palestine. When Israel was established in 1948, it was established on about 80% of Palestine. There are two parts of the country that were, not, that were not part of the state of Israel. They were called the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Now, neither one of those has natural boundaries. They were created as a result of Israelis sitting on a map and just drawing them. And for reasons I won't get into right now, they were not part of the initial state of Israel. About 20 years later, in 1967, Israel took those, took the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And then people started talking about the occupation, the occupation of those two parts of Palestine, some 20, 22 percent of Palestine. Well, what about the rest of it? When was the occupation of the rest of Palestine made okay? Why is it that we talk about the occupation and we forget the rest of Palestine? Now, when you grow up as an Israeli, you learn that 1948 was an act of heroism, the War of Independence. What you don't learn is that it was a, an incredibly effective campaign of ethnic cleansing. A dedicated, well-planned, year-long campaign of a cruel, brutal ethnic cleansing, where close to one million Palestinians were forced out of their homes and into exile. And hence, today, we have a population of some five million Palestinians living in refugee camps. Yet, we don't hear about that very much. We hear about the occupation of 1967. We hear that there's an Israel and there's an occupation. There's a legitimate Israel, and then there's this thing, problematic thing called the occupation. When did this happen? 
How is it that the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, the destruction of hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of towns and cities and communities, destructions of homes and schools and churches and mosques, was swept away, and now all we talk about is this one or two little parts of Palestine. How did this happen? When did we decide that that was okay? So the problem in Palestine is not the occupation. The problem in Palestine is that it was invaded, subjected to ethnic cleansing, and a regime of apartheid was imposed upon it. Now, there's an organization that I strongly recommend you look up. It's called Zohrot, Z-O-C-H-R-O-T, which means remembering. And Zohrot is an Israeli NGO that is dedicated to the memory of the destroyed towns and villages. And you look up all these different towns, all these different villages. How many people lived there? How was it destroyed? Which military unit destroyed it? Where do the people went and so on? And they have the details of what took place in each, in each, in each of these localities. Massacre, 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 on and on and on and on. A massacre in one location and then forced exile. A massacre in one location and forced exile. I strongly suggest also that you go online and look for the definition of the crime of genocide. Go online and read the definition of the crime of genocide. Then take a minute and review the history of Palestine over the last 70 years and see what you find. Because I did the same thing. And what I found was shocking. Why? Because of the similarities. What has taken place in Palestine over the last seven decades is nothing short of genocide. According to the definition of the crime of genocide. Genocide is a crime that is well defined by international law. As is ethnic cleansing, as is apartheid. And if anybody thinks that using these terms is anything short of an immense responsibility, think again. Using these terms, accusing a state of genocide, accusing a state of ethnic cleansing, and then accusing it of maintaining an apartheid regime is an enormous responsibility, and you shouldn't do it unless you know what you're talking about, unless you're absolutely certain that you know what you're talking about. The state of Israel has been engaged in genocide, in ethnic cleansing, and in imposing a regime of apartheid in Palestine. All three well-defined violations of international law, crimes according to international law. So the problem is not the occupation. The problem is settler colonialism. The problem is racism. The problem is violence which have been per per uh, perpetrated by Israel against the Palestinian people. The journey that I began here in San Diego some 20 years ago and then took to Palestine has shown me that, has shown me this is the reality with not a shred of a doubt, without a shred of a doubt. So people are always surprised, you know, somebody who comes from privilege and then goes against their privilege, and it's true. Privilege and conscience don't usually go hand in hand. But sometimes you're forced into it. And in my case, I was forced into it. There's nothing courageous about what I do. Growing a conscience is not a courageous thing. It's a duty. Sadly, not enough people with privilege do that or go through that process. But it is impossible for me as a person who has, who I believe has a conscience, 
not to reject Zionism, not to reject the state of Israel. It is impossible to people of conscience not to reject these things. Why? Because Zionism, the ideology that created the state of Israel, is a racist ideology. And it produced a brutal, violent, racist regime called the state of Israel. Is that anti-Semitic? I'm Jewish myself. I know countless Jewish people who think this way. In fact, I know countless Jewish people who thought this way and saw this long before I did. In fact, probably the largest community that is wholly anti-Zionist in the world are Jews, ultra-Orthodox Jews, who from the very, very beginning who from the very, very beginning, when Zionism just began, had warned that the creation of a so-called Jewish state, which they don't recognize themselves, even though they are Jews, the creation of a so-called Jewish state in Palestine will bring nothing but violence to the Holy Land. And they were right. They said this 120 years ago. They would ruin the good relations that used to exist between Jews and Arabs in the Holy Land, and Jews and Muslims around the world. And they were right. And they said that this would cast doubt as to the loyalty of Jewish people who live around the world. And they were right on that as well. So there's nothing anti-Semitic about rejecting Israel. There's nothing anti-Semitic about rejecting Zionism. Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. Rejecting racism, rejecting violence is quite in line with being Jewish and supporting Jews. It's true that the Zionists and Israelis like myself, we are Jewish. But rejecting that is not anti-Semitic. And the fact that we even have to say that points to a problem. Now, I was, like I said, I was in Palestine just uh, for three weeks. I just got back last week. And I spent a few, I spent about a, a week of that in Jordan. And as some of you may know, Jordan is also the home to millions of Palestinian refugees. And I visited one of the refugee camps. It's a refugee camp in the northern part of Jordan, near Jarash. It's called the Gaza Refugee Camp. And you walk along the road, the, you can't really call them streets because they're not really paved. And you see the children. And you walk into the homes, although calling them homes is, I mean, they're somebody's home, but they're far from being an appropriate uh, place to pe for people to live. The poverty, the lack of resources, the conditions, or the lack of conditions, are impossible to describe in words. It is so hor horrific. Some 40,000 people living on a one quarter of a square mile. Now, that particular camp is about a, maybe an hour's drive from the border with Palestine. And maybe from the border, maybe an hour drive from where their families had originated. Why are they living in this, in, in this poverty? Why are they living in these conditions? Only for one reason. As soon as the state of Israel was established, it made it illegal for the refugees to return. So these refugees are living, languishing, in camps, in horrifying conditions, only because they are banned from returning to their homes. And by the way, you ask any little kid there, where are you from, and they'll know exactly the town, the village from which they came, from which their family came. Nobody says, I'm from here. They all remember, Birsaba, Yafa, Askelan, they all remember, they know exactly where they're from. 
So they're living in these horrible conditions. As, as I was walking, I couldn't help thinking, on the one side of the Jordan River, the state of Israel, receiving close to $4 billion every year as foreign aid. Israel is a rich country. It's got a strong economy. Nobody in Israel lives like the Palestinians in refugee camps. Nobody does. No Israelis, Jews do anyway. Why are they getting $4 billion a year and the refugees living in these horrible conditions, horrifying conditions, if some NGO decides to give them a little money to pave a road or build sewage or maybe refurbish the school, which is overcrowded? That's a big deal. Wow, there's a paved road. Some NGO from I don't know where decided to put some money and help them pave the roads or build sewage. Four billion dollars go to a rich country that doesn't need it, that has perpetrated some horrific crimes against an entire nation, and here the very people who suffered from this are languishing in camps, barely afford to eat, with no health care, with no proper nutrition. Clean water is expensive. How does this even make sense? How do we get up in the morning and say this is okay? You know, the southern half of Palestine, or more than 50% of Palestine, the whole southern half is called the Nakab Desert. Now, the Nakab Desert is within what is considered proper Israel. I don't know why they call it proper, but pre-1967 Israel. Now, it's a very fertile desert, so it's very good for cultivating. Relative to deserts, it gets a lot of rain. In fact, I was just there and it's all green because of the rains. And there's underground water. Before Israel, before the Nakba, before 1948, there were about 100,000 Palestinian Bedouin living in the Nakab. And they were cultivating their lands, lands that they had, that they'd owned for centuries and centuries. When Israel came, and as a result of the ethnic cleansing campaign, 90% of them, 90% of them were forced into exile. Only about 10,000 Palestinian Bedouin were left. Many of them were forced into refugee camps in the Gaza Strip. Many of them went into Jordan. Today, some seven decades later, there are about 200, 250,000 Bedouin Palestinian in the Nekab. But what Israel did, the, the, the Bedouin that remained, were all pushed into one part, the northern part of the, of the region, of the Nekab. They're not permitted to cultivate. So what you have is this reality where you've got Israeli colonies, farming communities, cities, towns, that are blooming and wealthy and prosperous, right next to these townships of Palestinian Bedouin who are not allowed to cultivate the land and live in horrifying poverty, unemployment, and of course all the problems that we know rise when you have a big community living in poverty and unemployment. Half of the Palestinian Bedouin live in towns that Israel doesn't even recognize. So they get no water, no electricity, no roads, no access to emergency health care, nothing. They don't exist. About 100,000 Israeli citizens. These are citizens of the state of Israel. Kind of a dubious citizenship, a quasi-citizenship, really, because it's nothing like the citizenship that Israeli Jews who are privileged have. But still, that's what they call it. Living without access to resources. They have to buy water at inflated prices because we have to have water to drink and to wash. Citizens of the state of Israel living in an entirely different reality than the Jewish Israelis who live across the highway. And there's a particular point in the highway going down to the Nekab where you see the city of Omer, which is a new kind of Israeli city, new-ish, it's one of, the fourth, one of the four most prosperous cities in Israel, or Israeli cities. Across the street is Tel Saba, which is a township. 
with enormous unemployment and poverty. Now, they're not allowed to go and live in Omer, God forbid. If they're found walking down the street or driving down, they'll be stopped by police. These are citizens of the state of Israel, and these are citizens of the state of Israel. An entirely different reality. An entirely different set of laws under which they live. So it's not the occupation. It's the existence of this brutal regime that has taken over Palestine and is making life for Palestinians impossible. Zuchrot, this organization I mentioned earlier, they do tours. They have great tour guides, and you, if you, when you go or if you go, you should definitely check them out. And you see these tours in all these places that were destroyed. And you learn about what took place and what is still there, and you see some remnants. And recently, I went with a group of friends, and we asked one of their guides to give us a tour of the city of Yaffa. The city of Yaffa was a major Palestinian town, major metropolis. Over 100,000 people, theaters, shops, cafes, a rich political life, newspapers, I mean, you name it, a modern metropolis. Some of the greatest names in the Arabic world would come and perform in Yaffa. And our guide, Omar, did something very interesting. We stood there by the Hassanbek Mosque, which still stands, not far from the beach. Now, the entire area is Tel Aviv now. So we're in Tel Aviv, really. But it used to be a part of it that used to be Afa. And he showed us a series of pictures. The first one was a painting by an Israeli artist by the name of Nahum Gutman, who lived in Yaffa in the 1930s and 40s. And you look at his painting, and all you see are sand dunes. And you see the mosque, and you see the port. And in between, you see just two rows of beautiful little European-looking houses, basically the Israeli colony that was built there. That's it. The next thing he showed us was an actual photograph of that exact spot that was taken at the exact same time. A city full of houses and streets and roads full of people, but somehow in the painting they don't exist. In the photograph they exist, in the painting they're gone. The third picture we saw was what Yaffa looked like immediately after it was taken in 1948. And the only way to describe it is if you've ever seen pictures of Berlin after World War II. All those homes, all those buildings in rubble, ruins. It was taken immediately after the war. Rubble, nothing left. Not a single home standing. All destroyed. And then we look at it today. A beautiful promenade, a park, full, you know, covered in grass, a parking lot. Under the park, under the parking lot, under the promenade, or homes of thousands and thousands and thousands of Palestinians who were forced to leave. After 1948, out of about 100,000 people, only 3,000 people were left in Yaffa. The city was destroyed, and now we have the city of Tel Aviv, and nobody even remembers what was there. And then there's a little Arab house. You know, interestingly enough, all these Israeli towns there's always an Arab house, some exotic looking, kind of oriental, beautiful house. And we call it the Arab house. Where the Arabs go? Well, we don't know. And this particular Arab house is dedicated to the liberators of Yaffa. The liberators of Yaffa. Liberators? What did they liberate Yaffa of? Its indigenous population? Talk about changing the narrative. Shameless, the destruction and ethnic cleansing of Yaffa was an enormous crime. To call that liberating? 
But who's going to ask the question? You walk around this beautiful promenade. People are jogging. People are on the beach. It's wonderful. And there's a house commemorating the liberators of Jaffa. Nobody asked the question. And the entire country is like this. The entire country is like that. So the problem is not the occupation of 1967. The problem began much earlier. The problem is that all of us accepted the legitimacy of the ethnic cleansing. We accepted the legitimacy of the genocide. We accept the legitimacy of, an, of, a, camp, of, a, of a regime that is an apartheid regime. One set of laws for the privileged and another set of laws for the others. That's what Israel is. And the argument coming back from the supporters of Israel, the argument coming back from the Zionists is, how could you possibly say that they committed genocide? How could you possibly use the word ethnic cleansing? How could you suggest that Israel is an apartheid regime? You see, their problem is with the name. They're not ashamed of the ethnic cleansing. They're not ashamed of the massacres. They're ashamed of the name. We shouldn't call it that. The name is the problem? The name is the problem? Rejecting that is anti-Semitism? Rejecting these crimes is anti-Semitic? What kind of Judaism do you, do, do, do you believe in? How could you possibly equate rejecting violence and racism with anti-Semitism? Where did that even come from? How do we allow this conversation? How do we allow this reality to continue? How can we in good conscience stand by and see these crimes committed every single day? Because the killing hasn't stopped. The ethnic cleansing hasn't stopped. The regime of apartheid, the racist laws, that discriminate specifically against Palestinians, whether they're the citizens of the state or not, goes on every day. Israel created kind of a totem pole of the different status of the Palestinians. On the very bottom are the refugees in the camps. Their condition is the worst. There's no question unconscionable. Their conditions are the worst. A little bit above that are the Palestinians who live in the Gaza Strip and the area that used to be called or used to be the West Bank. Right above that are the Palestinians who have this quasi-citizenship, what they call the Palestinian citizens of Israel. And above that, at the very top, are Palestinians who live in diaspora and have citizenship and rights in other countries. You may have heard of the deal of the century. But you know the real name of the plan is not the deal of the century. It's a peace, it's a program for peace and prosperity. Peace and prosperity. And you can look it up, you can download it, the PDF. This is the great plan that Donald Trump and his team, his son-in-law and some others put together which basically gives Israel everything it possibly wants and demands complete surrender from the Palestinians. You should download it and read it. It's full of graphs and numbers and charts, different colors, different shades. And as I was reading it, I, re I came upon something that shocked even me, and it's pretty hard to shock me when it comes to Palestine after all these years. And it talks about 10 Palestinian towns that exist in the pre-67 Israel. In other words, what they call proper Israel. These are towns in which Palestinian citizens of Israel live. And it says that since they consider themselves to be Palestinian anyway, when someday, several years down the road, there is a Palestinian state, they will be joined with that Palestinian state. 
We're talking about about half a million people. Well, if you read it, it sounds fine. You know, they're Palestinians, there's a Palestinian state, fine, why not? But that's not what it's about. It's about stripping them of their rights and bringing them down a level on the totem pole. Now, for years, you heard this conversation about how we need to find a way to get rid of these Palestinians who are citizens of Israel. We don't call them Palestinians, we call them the Arabs of Israel. We need to get rid of them. But this was a conversation that, was, that took place on the fringe. It's not something anybody would say publicly because it's not polite. That conversation, which used, to be, which used to be considered fringe, is now in a peace plan with a rubber stamp of the President of the United States to take half a million Palestinians and strip them of their rights and have them join other Palestinians who have that lower status. Now, people say, yes, there's been a trend of extremism in Israel. Israel used to be a lot more moderate. It was kind of a peace-loving country, and now look at it. It's so extremist. You've got Netanyahu. You've got this. And it's an interesting, it's a, it's an interesting perspective. So when I hear this, I remind people that the state of Israel was established after a campaign of genocide and ethnic cleansing, massacres and ethnic cleansing. How much more extreme can you get? And those, that ethnic cleansing and those massacres were perpetrated by what's considered kind of a liberal, peace-loving Zionist government. It was called, considered labor, kind of left. But what they did was they were very good at maintaining the appearance of wanting peace the appearance of wanting peace, so talking about wanting peace one day. But of course, how can you have peace when you've got terrorists, you're dealing with terrorists? And the Palestinians are always somehow defined as terrorists. So the peace never came. In the last 15, 20 years, Israeli governments and Israeli society decided they don't need this appearance anymore. Why make the effort when we know we're not interested and we can get away with it anyway? So the conversation is much more blunt. The discourse is much more blunt. The government is much more blunt. Another element that used to be fringe in Israeli politics was a group that called themselves the Temple Mound Believers, or the Temple Mound Loyalists. Basically, this was a group of racist thugs they wanted to see the destruction of Al-Aqsa and the building of a third Jewish temple in its place. And they were fringe. They were a bunch of lunatics. Today, today, leaders of that particular group are sitting in the Israeli government, in the cabinet. One of them is the Minister of Defense. Another one is the Minister of Education. Another one sits in the, what they call the Security Cabinet, which is kind of an inner group of the Israeli government. They are now the establishment, within the establishment. Now, ideologically, I don't think there was ever a difference between them and other Zionists. But because they're kind of brutish, they're not statesmanlike, you know, there was a sense that we were embarrassed by them. And they organized tours, they always organized tours tours into the Temple Mount, which is the Haram al-Sharif. And there used to be a few crazies that would go, 10, 12 people maybe would go. Last year, there were about 60, 70,000 Israelis who went on these tours with them. They actually have a plan to create a greater Jerusalem with a temple in its center. And the plan of the Greater Jerusalem starts in Ramallah in the north and goes all the way to Bethlehem in the south. And when you ask, what are you going to do with the Arabs? What are you going to do with all the Palestinians who live in this area? Well, they say, and this has now become, this has now become the line. They're going to have three choices. 
They can remain as alien residents with no rights. They can leave and be compensated. Of course, Israel has never compensated a single Palestinian for taking their homes and kicking them off their land, but it's, it's a good way to say it. Or they can fight and die. Those are three options for Palestinians. Now, this is true not only for the Palestinians living in that particular part. That is true. This is the vision. This is the vision of what will happen to Palestinians, the fate of Palestinians. They can stay under Israeli rule and live as aliens without rights. They can leave, or they can fight and die. So the very definition of having a government, having a state that governs people, different populations with different laws, is apartheid. That is apartheid. And it doesn't matter what kind of status particular they have, their lives are governed by the state of Israel. Even the Palestinians who live on the outside in refugee camps, they can't return. They're stuck in these camps because Israel won't allow them to return. Every child in Gaza that's born has to be registered in Israel. And of course, the lives of two million people in the Gaza Strip are governed by Israel. That's why they have no access to clean water. That's why they have no access to medical care. That's why they have no access to proper nutrition. That's why they can be bombed like that. Now, Israel likes to think, because in Israeli society, you've got this separation. There are the settlers. Those are the Jews who went to live in the West Bank. And then there are Israeli good Israelis, the rest of us, who live in the other parts of the country. Because we're not settlers. Really? How are we different? Tel Aviv, the city of Tel Aviv, which is supposed to be this liberal, you know, bastion of liberal Israeliness sits on countless Palestinian uh, villages and towns. And this is true for every other Palestinian, Israeli, Israeli city and town. How are we different? Now, this thing that used to be called the West Bank, by the way, no longer exists. There's no West Bank. I mean, it exists in old maps, and some, you know, some people still talk about it, but it doesn't exist. It's called Judea and Samaria. It is fully integrated with the rest of the state of Israel. Fully integrated. When you drive along the highways, the signs that point you to the Israeli towns in that part of the country, and the signs that point you to Israeli towns in other parts of the country are the same. But the way they describe Judea and Samaria is that there are pockets of problematic population. Pockets of a problematic population who live in enclosed areas with a wall around them, checkpoints, deprived of rights, deprived of water mostly, with Israeli colonies all around them living just like anybody else, you know, free and alive and happy. That is what the West Bank used, you know, the thing that used to be called the West Bank. Now what's interesting is that the situation in Palestine is horrifying and it gets worse and worse and worse. Every time Donald Trump decides to award Israel with some new gift, things get actually worse on the ground because the security personnel are emboldened. So they arrest more children and they shoot more civilians with impunity. We saw this immediately when Trump announced the um, recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and that he was going to move the embassy. Immediately you saw a spike in the number of Palestinians being arrested, Palestinian children. Now we're at a point that really he's approved everything. In other words, Israel has complete, total control over everything. He's given them everything. Which means things on the ground for Palestinians on a very every, on a day by day basis is getting worse and worse. On the other hand, like Ahmed was saying in his introduction, we have presidential candidates who are saying they will not go to the APAC conference in, out of principle. If you thought, if anybody mentioned that that would happen, I don't know, five, ten years ago, they think you're nuts. That's not possible. APAC is such a strong lobby. 
Today we have a major presidential candidate who talks about conditioning aid to Israel with its treatment of the Palestinians. Now, none of that would happen if it wasn't for the work that you guys do on campuses, SJP, for years. Bernie Sanders would not be talking like that if it wasn't for years and years and years of incredibly effective and hard work that you guys do on campuses and other peace groups doing um, across the country. None of that would have happened. So you can remember that, that the, you see the progress and you see the results of your hard work. That's how it trickles up. So there's a shift. There is a shift. And there's this myth that Palestinians are divided. There's a shift that Palestinians don't know what they want. There's this myth that Palestinians um, do not have a unified vision of their future. But that couldn't be farthest from the truth. Go and speak to activists in the Nakab Desert. Go and speak to activists in Yaffa, in Jerusalem, in Al Jalil, in the north, in the Muthalath, any other part of Palestine, certainly Ramallah, and in Gaza. You will hear the exact same vision. You will hear the exact same unified message. A free Palestine is a free Palestine. That means all of Palestine, from the river to the sea, from the northern border with Lebanon to the Gulf of Aqaba, a free Palestine where all Palestinians live free. Free of roadblocks, free of racist laws, free of the denying of water, free. There is no division at all. So they say, yeah, well, look at the Palestinian Authority. Well, Palestinian Authority doesn't represent anyone. Certainly not Palestinians who live outside Ramallah. And what does that vision tell us? What are we supposed to do? Some people say, yes, we should take, up, take arms again. Really? You want to take up arms against Israel? But Palestinians gave us a gift. In 2005, Palestinian civil society came out with a call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, BDS. That call was a gift. That call was a guide to all of us to say, here is what we need you to do. This is what we need to happen so that we can finally see justice and freedom. We don't want violence. We don't want the armed resistance. Here is what we need you to do. This is the way forward. And because it's such an effective call, because it's so dedicated, because it's so clear, because it is not violent, it took Israel a few years and the Zionists a few years to kind of figure out what to do with this. And you'd be amazed at the number of conferences and articles and documentaries and news programs dealing with this BDS thing. How are we going to do? We can't kill it, so what do we do with it? Because a violent mili uh, militaristic society knows how to kill. They don't know what to do with something like this. So they said, aha, it's anti-Semitic. It's anti-Semitic. Really? It's anti-Semitic? First of all, there's so many Jewish people, including people, Israeli people, who support it. Number one. Number two, if we want to debate whether or not it's anti-Semitic, let's look at what the uh, call for boycott is demanding. What are the demands of the call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions? Ending the military occupation. So allowing these Palestinians who live in these Bantustans and what used to be the West Bank to be free. Equality, equal rights for Palestinians, so that the Palestinians who live in Palestine and people like myself have the same rights. And the return of the Palestinian refugees to their homes and their land. So justice, freedom, and equality. 
If somebody wants to tell me that justice, freedom, and equality are anti-Semitic, that a call for justice, freedom, and equality anywhere in the world somehow contravenes Jewish values? Who's the lunatic that says this? Chuck Schumer says this, and other Zionist politicians say this. The Israeli government says this. But they're hardly the standard. How can something that is so reasonable, so remedial, be anti-Semitic and so just? The demands for that the, the, the call for BDS has put forward are reasonable, measured, and remedial. In other words, they provide a remedy to the difficult conditions in which Israel has placed the Palestinians. It doesn't even mention Jewish people. It doesn't talk about deporting or kicking out or killing, God forbid. No. It's about fixing the reality on the ground so that Palestinians can live like other people. The privileged notion is that if others have privilege like myself, they'll somehow take away from my privilege. That's absurd. That's the sick privilege perspective. But it's not true. It is true that when the refugees return and somebody lived in somebody's house for seven decades and didn't pay rent, yeah, they need to pay, sure. You know, a lot of the Palestinian homes, a lot of beautiful Palestinian um, neighborhoods were not destroyed, like in Jerusalem, for example, in West Jerusalem, and other cities around the country. Some of these homes are used by, or, you know, have Jewish people live there, people who came, you know, that came to colonize. Some of them are boutique hotels, because they're beautiful, oriental homes. Some of them are restaurants, some of them are galleries. Well, yeah, you know what? You lived for free for seven decades. You're going to have to pay back rent. It's not the end of the world. But there's nothing even remotely racist about the call for BDS. Quite the opposite. It is a struggle against racism. It is a call for justice. It is a call to bring justice to the people who suffered as a result of the occupation and destruction of Palestine for seven decades. That's what it's about. So it's very easy to be hopeless. It's very easy to be depressed. Very easy. I hear this all the time. Oh, it's so difficult. It's so hopeless. Really, you're hopeless. You want to go live in Gaza for a month and see how you feel? You're hopeless living here? You live here and you're hopeless? They say that Gaza has the highest rate of PhDs per capita in the world. Why would anybody get a PhD if they're hopeless? Why would anybody send their kids to a school that's been bombed if they didn't believe in a, in a, in a better future? We're hopeless here? Go to Palestine and you'll see hope. Every town, every village, every city. In the Nekab, without the water, in the Gaza Strip, living in a, refu in, 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 in a concentration camp. People who live in, 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 in dis displaced people all over the place. Talk to them. We're hopeless here. We don't have that luxury. We don't have the luxury to be hopeless. We need to seize the opportunity, and we need to fight with everything we've got so that hope becomes a reality. Now, where does hope lie? Does hope lie in what we have today? in an occupied Palestine, in an apartheid regime, in an ongoing ethnic cleansing? Is there hope there? Because if there is hope there, go ahead and support Israel all the way. Or is there hope in a free Palestine without racist laws, without an apartheid regime, with one person, one vote? Well, where do you think hope lies? I know what I think. Whichever of these choices you feel is more hopeful, you should fight for. Every single one of us here should fight for that. We don't have the luxury to be hopeless because we're paying Israel to do what it's doing. So we better stand up and make a difference if we disagree. Now, what is the country called again? I want to come back to that. 
People usually like to say Israel, Palestine, Palestine, Israel, Israel occupied territories, occupied Palestinian territories, Israel proper, disputed areas. That's a lot of names for one small country. So what I suggest is, if you're not sure what to call the country, look back at your values. It's got nothing to do with religion. It's got nothing to do with politics. Look at your values. Check with yourselves. Do you support violence and racism? Or do you suppose support justice and freedom? Because if you support racism and violence, go ahead and call it Israel, because that's what it is. Calling the country Israel legitimizes the violence and the racism. If we believe in justice and in freedom, we need to call the country by the name of the people who are indigenous to the, to the land, who are the Palestinians. If we believe in justice and in freedom and in equality, the name of the country is Palestine. So I want to invite everybody here tonight to reflect. I'm not going to tell you what to call it, but you reflect on your values. You examine your values, and then immediately once you do, decide how you call this country. Do you want to legitimize the racism and the brutality and the violence, or do you want to support the struggle for justice and freedom? And then you go with that. But all this Israel, Palestine, Palestine, Israel is nonsense. It can't be both. Then the counter to that is, aha, you want to kill all the Jews. You want to throw them into the ocean. Where did that come from? People ask me often when I say this, they say, aha, where do you want the Jews to go? I don't want them to go anywhere. Why should they go anywhere? If they want to go, they can go, but why do they have to go? You're telling me that Israelis, Israelis can't live in a state with equality, where there's justice? where there's a one person, one vote. Israel just had three elections in a span of one year. That's quite remarkable. And they're getting the same results over and over again. I don't know if you noticed that. There's something about madness and trying to do the same thing and expecting different results. Well, they just got very similar results again. Who cares which one of these war criminals becomes the prime minister? What I care about is that there are five million Palestinians living in Palestine, governed by the state of Israel, who have no voice who are not participating in the elections. Five million people do not get to participate in the elections of the government that will govern their lives. And now they're actually talking, if you look at the Israeli press, they're actually already projecting the next, the fourth election. Who cares which one of them becomes prime minister? What's important is that that state which is a rogue state, which is a violent regime, be brought down and replaced with a democracy, with equal rights, with one person, one vote. Yes, that may mean that Israelis will have to live under a Palestinian prime minister. The whites in South Africa were horrified by that thought, by the way, and then guess what? They got Nelson Mandela. That was such a bad deal for them. And there are thousands of Nelson Mandelas in Israeli prisons, by the way. Israel's got thousands of political prisoners. And their kids will go to school, and they may have a Palestinian teacher, maybe a Palestinian principal, a Palestinian professor. And the sky is not going to fall. They're going to get up in the morning, go to work, send their kids to school, and that's going to be the new reality. But it's never going to be the new reality unless we act. It's never going to be the new reality unless we organize. It's never going to be the new reality if our members of Congress, if our representatives think it's okay to send $3 billion or $4 billion to Israel every year. We need to speak up. We need to act. We need to organize. We need to demand boycott, divestment, sanctions, isolation. We need to demand that the state of Israel not be allowed to participate in cultural or sporting events or academic events or academic institutions. That's how apartheid was brought down in South Africa. That's how apartheid will be brought down in Palestine as well. I want to end on a hopeful note. 
I am optimistic. The reality is severe, don't get me wrong. The reality is severe in Palestine. But Palestinians have hope. Palestinians, particularly in Palestine, are the most unoccupied people I've ever met because it hasn't reached them inside. In fact, Israelis are probably more occupied than the Palestinians. Palestinians don't need our mercy. They don't need our sorrow. They don't need our pity. They need our support in the struggle. They are fighters, and we need to be there and do the work here so that they can be free. And we can do it. And I absolutely believe, I absolutely believe that if we do our job, I absolutely believe that if we take on the responsibility that we should have taken on a long time ago, Palestine can and must and will be free and soon. Thank you very much.